watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television! Yay! For the community, by the Hi, I'm Sarah Connor, and you're watching Life and Style with Sarah. On tonight's show, we are going to start a two-part series called Doggy Tales about dog training and ownership. My guest is Lori Foss, owner of Dog Training and Counseling Service, and she is going to share with us some of her experiences training dogs through the stories of four of her clients and their very different situations and very different dogs. Lori, thanks for joining me. Oh, well, thanks for having me on. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your history with dog training? How long have you been doing okay. it? How many well, clients have you Well, um, my family was very academically oriented, and of course they wanted me to get a degree in something. And I was studying animal behavior in college and getting very disenchanted with what they were teaching. Mm -hmm. And at that same time, I ended up with a very difficult dog who I've been doing this since 1975, and she's probably on the top of the list of some of the more difficult dogs I've worked with, which kind of led me on a search to find out, well, what am I going to do about this? And that eventually led me to a school, and I took a course and decided that's what I was going to do, and I've been doing it ever since. How many dogs do you think you've worked with? Well, one day I sat down and tried to figure that out. I went through um, a breed book and made little checks on a list of all the different breeds. Mm -hmm. and that was well over 130, and that may have changed since the last time I did this. Wow. And I figured out sort of, hmm, good guesstimate, mm -hmm. that I've literally worked with thousands of dogs. Wow. So and they're all <laughs> similar situations, but different dogs, different owners. So everything is well, kind every, of Well, anytime you change a variable, you mm -hmm. change the whole situation. So I have worked with dogs <clears throat> that were living in one family <clears throat> to be adopted by another family. Mm -hmm. And the situation completely changed, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. Hmm. Sometimes the problem is where the dog is living. And if we change it to a place that's more compatible with the dog, well, we've got a whole other situation. And sometimes the reverse is true. Hmm. So, Interesting. Yeah. Um, so this evening we have, well, let's introduce your friends okay. to This is Juanita. <laughs> this is Juanita, and Juanita was abandoned in the year 2000 in a building in downtown Hartford. And the building was affiliated with the police department in some way. I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm. how. But one of the uh, people who worked at that building, I had trained their dog. And they knew that I loved dogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, they brought her home, but she wasn't housebroken. And they didn't know what to do with her. Mm -hmm. So they put her in a little cardboard box and brought her to my house. <laughs> and you've had and her I ever thought, since. well, you know, she doesn't eat much. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I have a housebroker. And she's been with me ever since. I'm really not sure how old she is, but she's at least 10. And, and Merritt. Merritt, who's snoozing out over here, um, I got him as a puppy, and Merritt is a Dutch shepherd, and okay. most Dutch shepherds are a little bit smaller than him, uh -huh. and brindle, hmm. and he's marked more like a Belgian Malinois, okay. and I got Merritt as a puppy because a friend of mine was taking care of his mother in the litter, and I kept going and looking at the puppies, and you know, that's a big mm -hmm. mistake if you love yeah. dogs, so, <laughs> so you that's how I ended Merit. up with him, yep. Excellent. So we're going to... Um, see a video of um, four of your clients in four different segments. And the first one is June Noble and her German Shepherd, Excel, and uh, Lily. So take a look and we will discuss her individual situation and how Lori uh, helped her with her dog training needs. Mother of two German Shepherds. They are my family. I do have children, but they are my immediate family. Excel will be four years old in July. And how old is Lily? Lily. <laughs> Lily was eight years old last December. I came upon Laura's name many years ago, probably 20 years ago, when I had an incorrigible German Shepherd who was eating his way through this house. And as I went to work, I'd come back and I'd find more help. But now this guy was six so. weeks old when I got him, and he went through the traditional training with a gentle leader, which is a, a collar that goes over their nose, mm -hmm. and instead of pulling on their neck, it pulled it turns their head to the side so that they don't have the strength to, to lunge forward. 
Okay. Trained him on that until he got to be, well, when he was much older, much bigger, say, let's say, a year and a half old, and I realized that he, he was dog aggressive. That is, he was not a fighting dog, but he would lunge when he saw a dog, and he would bark and um, pull like crazy. And I, so when you were walking him, he walking would see a dog, and he would want to go over to it. I and couldn't contain him. So I called upon Laura. Strong, and he's strong. He's a strong boy. So you needed to... to Get him able to, to get be controlled on a walk. And he's, uh, so Laurie suggested the electronic collar. Mm -hmm. uh, or some people know it as an e-collar. E -collar or, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then also the pinch collar. Um, so the e-collar I used initially to just let him know that I was the boss. Mm -hmm. he's, he thinks he's alpha. <laughs> and I keep telling him I'm alpha. I'm the mm -hmm. boss. See how it doesn't hurt. I mean, I did it to myself. Mm -hmm. Laurie made me do it to myself. And it, it, on, the, on the lowest setting, it, it really doesn't hurt. It just has a little reminder. So we went out in the backyard and we did come, sit, stay, mm -hmm. um, and all those, those basic, all my basic training. And when I take him out for a walk, I do use the pinch collar. And that's the, mm -hmm. uh, that's the one with the hooks in it. And it's, it's not, not doesn't have the points. It's a nice one that it's just got kind of a blunt, blunt edges, and uh, and that gives me the power to pull him should he decide to take off. Right. But but he doesn't do that. He walks. He heals beautifully, and we walk every. I day. love Laurie. She's she's uh, she's sort of oh middle gosh. of the road. They, they used to train dogs. Yeah. With really aggressively like well, that. Yeah. Aggressive and with pain. I mean. Pain yeah. Pain. Now it's kind of gone the other end of the spectrum. With food, they don't right. do anything unless they get food. So I think Laurie is sort of middle of the road. But Laurie doesn't do any of the old-fashioned stuff. Get it, get it on. Get it on. So after watching June with her um, two German shepherds, there were a couple things that she brought up, and one was, and you hear this a lot, um, the alpha dog. Well, as, as I was trying to explain to you before, I think one of the problems that. I've had, and it seems to be an increasing problem as I get greater awareness and understanding, is that I think sometimes people paint things with too broad of a brush. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly if the dog has no respect for you, you can't control them, mm -hmm. and they're kind of pushing you around, doing what they want to do, including obnoxious aggression behavior, then obviously you are not in control of the situation. So if you want to call that being alpha, well, mm -hmm. to some extent that's true. But even if you are alpha, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean your dog has understanding. And that's equally important. Your dog needs to respect you and also understand what it is you want them to do. Because if they don't, then you're really not going to get the right. kind of behavior you're looking for. So being in charge for. is different than being in charge and having your dog well, you trained have, to understand you. You can have understanding mm -hmm. on some level and no respect. Mm -hmm. And then your dog says, well, yeah, I kind of know what you mean, but <laughs> I'm not doing that. Right. And then you can have dogs that are respectful. And I've worked with people who actually have gone too far the other way, mm -hmm. where the dogs are afraid of them, mm -hmm. but they can't get the dog to do what they want because the dog doesn't know what they want. Right. So they're not, they're, it's not really an alpha kind of situation. It's, again, lacking of understanding. But I think that if you have a pet and you want to live in a harmonious way, even if your dog might be smarter than you in some ways, the reality mm -hmm. is that you live in this world and you really need to be the guiding force. And if you let your dog do it, you're going to get in trouble. So she, um, she talked a little bit about the tools that she was using. So um, why did you select the e-collar for Well, um, um, you know, I think that I would like people to know that mm -hmm. you can't just take any piece of equipment and say, oh, that worked for her. I'm going to use that, too. Right. And a lot of people That's have... That's very important to It's know. very important, mm -hmm. particularly with an e-collar, because uh, it is so easy to use. It is also so easy to misuse. Mm -hmm. But the reason that I used it for June is because her dog is very quick, mm -hmm. very athletic, very smart. And one of the things that you have as an advantage with an e-collar is just push-button instant control. Mm -hmm. You can turn it up. You can turn it down. You can use whatever level is appropriate, but without a foundation of training, it's kind of a useless training right. tool. Um, but because I think he just was overwhelming to her uh, physically, that mm -hmm. that was one of the main reasons that I chose the e-collar for her in her situation. 
And with, I, I think, um, it, with big dogs that are quick and smart, like you really need to make sure they are well trained. So that well, yeah. I mean, they yeah. just have a lot more potential to get into trouble. He was right. acting out and behaving aggressively. I don't know that he would have ever, ever really hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. But if you have a dog of his size, he's a German Shepherd. That's right. scary to some people. And he's barking and growling and looking like he's going to do something. In some cases, it doesn't matter if he does or he doesn't right. because he's already it's scared you scary. and made you uncomfortable. Right. And if you're having trouble holding him, the reality is that June could fall. Mm -hmm. She could get injured, and I've known many people to have been injured just because their dog overpowered them, right. and it, it can be dangerous. So, so we're going to talk a, uh, a little bit more in part two about equipment, training equipment. Okay. Um, and we're going to move in on to our next dog tale, which is Kathy, Mike, Sadie, and Stella. Take a look. I'm Kathy Barber, and this is my husband, Michael, and... This is Sadie, our 10-year-old Cocker Spaniel. Sadie, you got to smile. <laughs> and this is Stella, who we recently rescued from the Protectors of Animals Association. It's called POAinc.org. And Stella was approximately a year old on January 2nd when we were approved. to, to So to have a little tiny dog like this, a nine-pound ball of dynamite, we call, she's just full of dynamite and adrenaline. And, and she's more energetic she's, than... She's, she's young, too. She's, she's yeah. somewhere between a year and two years. So she's still puppyish. Yeah, she's, she's very puppyish, yeah. yeah. And this one, this one, although she's 10 and she seems like she's very tired, this is how she's been her whole life. <laughs> so it's quite a change yeah. to have an energetic puppy versus just yeah. a lap dog. My yeah. first dog, my first Cocker Spaniel, and went to training in Milford, where I learned a very rigid and regimented style of I rescued Sophie, my second cocker. Mm -hmm. So I now had a five and a half year old Susie and my, my new puppy, Sophie. And I was beside myself as to how I was gonna heal with both dogs on my right, because mm -hmm. that's how I had learned. Uh. And I thought, okay, Sophie's very dominant and so and Susie was very submissive, but still you you have to have concerns about are they gonna get tangled up together and whatnot. I thought, I really need to find out how to do this. So I checked around, and I got Lori's name, and I signed up for a, a group class with her. And Lori just, she taught me to think like a dog. She taught me that you don't have to heal on the right, that there's no law, that if you have a dog who's learned to heal on the right, then the second dog heals on the left. I mean, that's logical. Right, it never right. even occurred to me. Uh, she taught me so many things about working with Sophie. And I also had uh, some difficulty because Sophie was very smart, but she wasn't motivated by food at all. And mm. I learned to train using treats. So, so your initial training was, was positive, treat, positive. treat oriented. Yeah, and treat oriented. Okay. And Susie had been, my first cocker was very motivated by treats and say Sophie could care less. So it was teaching me more about how to praise her more and work with her, and she was very, very competitive in training school, uh -huh. and she's so energetic, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we have really good leash walking now, oh, very that's good, good leash manners, and Lori also taught me that you don't, if you're not going to have a show dog, and you just want a dog who's well behaved, you don't have to heal, you just want leash manners, so that was yeah. a really important <laughs> So after seeing um, Kathy and Mike with their two dogs and their new puppy Stella, um, it's a huge contrast to Excel and Lily. Small, much smaller dogs, you know, the nine pound ball of dynamite isn't going to do much harm if right. she well, decides to pull. You know <laughs> that if Stella's on the leash, she's not going to knock you down unless right. you trip over her. Right. So that's certainly a difference. And Kathy is somebody who, I've been doing this for long enough, mm -hmm. that I've actually seen three generations of her dogs. Mm -hmm. I knew Susie, um, I knew Sadie and Sophie, and mm -hmm. Sophie, I guess, was in the middle. I'm going to get it mixed up. Um, and just to interject, you usually heal on the left. You heal on the yeah, left. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> I just want to clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what's happening in her life now is she's very busy. She mm -hmm. has two careers. Um, she's, well, newly married maybe the past four or five years. Uh, she used to live in a condo. If you live in a condo in a, or an apartment, you have to hold your dogs to much higher standards of behavior. She's got a beautiful big backyard. Mm -hmm. yes, she can have a little tiny dog out there to run around. It's like, 
you know, she has her own national park to play mm -hmm. in. So because of all those things, it really isn't all that important to have the same standard of behavior as she had. When, when she had the two cockers and she lived in a condo, taking her dogs out past neighbors that didn't like dogs, mm -hmm. taking her dogs past other dogs that were acting up, her dogs had to be much better behaved in that mm -hmm. circumstance. And so you know, one of the primary goals she has for um, Stella is, um, and I don't know why her all, all her dogs' names are S's. We're going to have to, we're gonna have to get <laughs> to the confusing. bottom of that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway. Um, Housebreaking, that yeah. was the big thing with her. Yeah. You know, the guy that found her in the building, um, he didn't know what to do with that. Right. And, you know, of course, a little dog isn't going to wreck your house quite the same as a big dog with housebreaking, but still, they can do a lot of damage. And so that's really, at this point, probably her primary her issue. Point. And mm -hmm. just some basic communication mm -hmm. skills. But I know she's not going to put the same kind of time in, and I don't think she has to. And I think mm -hmm. she's happy with that. And right. so you have to kind of set a standard that's realistic and reasonable and something that, you know, you can live with and uh, is fair to your dog and fair to you. And mm -hmm. I think Stella is very happy to be there. Mm -hmm. And she's oh, very happy. Oh, they were happy. sweet. They were, yeah, they were great. Yeah, so she's got a them. good life. And, and Stella was, you know, from a rescue group. So she was a little bit older. But I think she's, you know, Stella's got a maid now. So <laughs> she's got the good life. Right. So, you know, her expectations are just much lower for all the reasons that I said. And that's fine. Yeah. We'll talk, in part two, we're going to talk a little bit more about setting training goals. Um, our next uh, dog tale is Karen and her Mastiff Colt, and it's just fascinating even just to watch him. So take a look. Uh, well, my name is Karen Ream, and this is Colt, and I've had Colt for one month. He's a 17-month-old English Mastiff puppy, and he is getting used to living in West Hartford. As you can see, he's pretty relaxed about everything. <laughs> um, and uh, he is a very great example of what a Mastiff should look like, an English Mastiff should look like. And he's going to grow into a quite a beautiful boy. He's at least 150, he's probably more than that. He will be over 200. A very gentle, sweet breed, and he looks like he's going to be one of the gentlest breeds you're ever going to meet. They, uh, they're pretty lazy. And um, they mostly just want to sit next to their person. Nine years ago, just about now, I got an English Mastiff. That was my first Mastiff, and I got him as a, a puppy. Mm -hmm. And within a few days of bringing him home, I enrolled in, in one of Lori's classes. And so she knew him all his life, and he mm -hmm. just passed away last fall. So um, this guy, it's a little different kind of training because... Uh, he, I haven't had him from a tiny puppy, so we're having to learn each other in a different way. And even though he looks, you know, he's just quiet and hanging out right now, if he decides that I want to go left and he wants to go right, right. he's really big, so we have to work that out. So that's what we're doing with Lori right now, is, uh, is figuring out uh, how we're going to get our um, system. Uh, Mastiffs are generally very person focused and so they really want to please you and, and mm -hmm. uh, you don't really need to be too firm with them but because this guy didn't grow up with me mm -hmm. he's just not paying attention and so okay. we've just uh, you started to use the pinch collar for a little while uh, on him until he gets the idea and as soon as I put it on him he, he got it you know he's <laughs> just like oh that's he's like, what okay you to do. but you know their necks are so thick um, that a regular collar. Let's see that neck feel, again. You know, they're just look cute. at that big old neck. And this is where his weight, his weight is going to come. Big as advocate of uh, of good dog training because it trains the person. And mm -hmm. you know, going back to uh, to class with him made me realize how lazy and spoiled I had gotten over the years because my dog knew me so well. And mm -hmm. so you know, I was had developed all sorts of bad habits and. Um, it was just that he was good natured enough, you know, to let me. He's not, away. you know, right. pulling and you know, mm -hmm. barking and going all over the place. But, but that doesn't mean, you know, that he'll come when I tell him to come, you know. And so, we, that's why we're we're working on that, and that's why going to class helps because he's he's going to be distracted there. Right. Well, are you handsome? Hi. Yeah. Good job. Good job. So after seeing Colt, who is not even full grown, he's going to get to be 200 pounds. Um, the sweetest, most placid dog, but also because of the virtue of him being big requires training. Well, I think, uh, if I remember, she said, 
you know, if Colt decides to go right and she's going mm -hmm. left, we've got a big problem here. Right. <laughs> and uh, Colt was a dog who came from a kennel called Beowulf Mastiffs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, this particular breeder places some of her older dogs if they're not going to be good show prospects or for a variety of different reasons. And so I think Colt was 17 months when she got him. Now, I had originally met her with her previous Mastiff named Wally. Mm -hmm. and she had him as a pup. And Wally and he, Wally and Colt, are very similar, but different in enough ways that mm -hmm. it's throwing her off. Uh, for instance, I think I told you the story where Wally it was so sensitive that with a big, thick, buckle collar, I could take my index finger, put it in the collar, and say, Wally? And he'd say, okay, whatever you say. Wow. And Colt is, you know, he, he's not unamenable to training, but he's more of a dog. Yeah. Wally was very... Just an opinion. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't really, I, I really do want to go right when you want to go left, you know, yeah. and I'm not so sure I'm, I'm going to go along with that. And Wally, because he was a puppy when she got her and because she had all this time to get to know him and they had this bond, she's trying to forge a similar bond and I think she's, well, Merritt has an opinion about <laughs> that. <laughs> um, she's trying to, I think, in some ways to handle him in a very soft kind of Wally-like way. Mm -hmm. And he's not a hard dog, but as I say, he's more of a dog. So she needs to learn his individual personality. Yeah, and not be so tentative mm -hmm. with him and not be afraid she's going to um, harm the bond she's trying to forge by mm -hmm. being more assertive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the lesson that she's going to have to learn with, uh, with Colt. Well, and it's also a lesson, I think, that just because your dog is big, it doesn't mean you have to be tough with it. Or if a dog is small, you know, they may be even more willful than a Wally. I mean, yeah, just, dogs, regardless of size, have their own personality yeah, I mean, really, personality um, and training needs. Colt is a very soft dog, as mm -hmm. far as dogs go, mm -hmm. but just his sheer size mm -hmm. makes it hard. Yeah. So. Yeah, you need to make sure that he's... And like she said, if he's going to choose to not listen, you need to make sure that well, yeah. you I can mean, depend on him not running in the street or doing something that's going to Of course, if he ran in the street, he'd probably be fine, and the car <laughs> the would car probably would be a be wreck. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but he was, uh, the girls in the video were, those are my daughters, and they just loved him. He was well, he's, so it, sweet He's exceptionally them. sweet and exceptionally large, and mm -hmm. it's a really... I think a very cool combination and yes. he's very fun to work with. He was. Yeah. I was I was wishing for just part of his placid nature in my <laughs> dog. <laughs> he was half his, not even half his size. So our next story is Donna and her English bulldog Bird Bergdorf. And um, her story is a little bit different because her dogs are older and she's kind of in the the later stages of dog ownership. So take a look. Bergdorf, look at the camera. This is my English bulldog, Bergdorf. He's 11. Um, and my name's Donna. Now, wh how, when did you get Bergdorf? I got him when he was a puppy. I got him at 10 weeks old. So, as a puppy, is he, was he teeny tiny? He was 10 pounds, actually. Oh, wow. And how much does he weigh now? Um, now he weighs about 40. So, and you had an, another bulldog as well? Yes. I had a female who just recently um, died. Um, she was ten and a half. First. Bergdorf first as a puppy, and then I got Colby. She was nine months old. Bergdorf, since I had never had a dog, I took him to um, Lori Fast, who did private lessons with him, and mm -hmm. also went to some of her um, group. She does a group training thing too, and I also took him to a puppy kindergarten as well. When okay. I first, first got him, and then when I got Colby, I kind of you know I, I did some private lessons with her with two dogs. You know, like the big thing was I was worried that they would you know, that they might not get along, and then what do you do? The, the new dog usually would go back to the breeder or wherever, and I really hoped that, um, you know, that it would work out, and it did. They got along fine. The they did. Time. Now, Lori has helped you. These guys, you, she helped you when they were puppies, yep. and then she, she, helped me. she helped as they've been aging, right? So you've had some special issues yeah. uh, when they became older. I've had bulldogs are prone to a lot of injuries, not injuries, a lot of health issues, I mean, ears, and, and skin, and breathing, and it's, 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 a, it's a really, it's a really high maintenance. You also had some behavioral issues because of health issues, right? Is that true? Yeah. Or, t or tell, talk a little bit about that. Okay, well, Chloe was not feeling well these past couple of months. Um, I don't know, Lori and I have talked about this too, and for that, um, that I, t I take them to Tanya Baddest in Farmington. Um, what sometimes happened was happening was that, you know, he could tell she wasn't feeling well and she wasn't herself. 
he growl at her. And sometimes they'd get into these little fights and stuff. And it was really sad. And I guess, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure why it happened, but they, mm -hmm. it never happened before until she got sick. And usually Lori says that, you know, one of your dogs can usually tell you when another dog isn't feeling well. I definitely don't want to get another puppy because I don't want to take time away from him. So, yeah. I mean, that, those puppies are a lot of work. Even if you have Lori Fass as your best friend and Tanya Baston as your right. vet, it's still a lot of work. A lot of work, <laughs> right. So you so, would get a more mature. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, in a couple of months after the summer, mm -hmm. I'm going to use that. That's what I was looking for. So um, Donna's story with Bergdorf, who, when I saw him, he made me just giggle, too, with his just classic <laughs> bulldog face. Was I loved it. Um, but a different situation. Her dogs are older. Um, well, bulldogs are higher maintenance health-wise, and she had just lost one of her dogs. Yeah. I mean, if so. you knew Donna, you would know from looking at that that uh, she was very sad in, yeah. in that clip. And Colby had, I don't think we mentioned it in the video, but Colby had passed away just a week. Yeah, less earlier. than a week. So, earlier. yeah, less than a week. So yeah. that's. And Bergdorf, that I guess, that. is going to be 12 mm -hmm. in December. And Bulldogs are not known to live a long time, so Bergdorf is doing great. Mm -hmm. And Colby, I think, was just 11, and so mm -hmm. that was pretty good for her, too. But right. it was very hard for her because she's never had dogs before. Mm -hmm. And so. I met Bergdorf originally when he was nine months old, mm -hmm. and she had adopted Colby when she was nine months from a breeder, similar situation mm -hmm. to Colt. And so the issues that she had in the beginning were completely different than the issues that she had later on. Um, she's a big dog spoiler, <laughs> which, you know, there's good spoiling and there's bad spoiling, and mm -hmm. maybe we can talk about that some more later. Right. Um, but what ended up happening was as Colby started to get sick, Bergdorf started going after her. And I told her that I can't tell you how many times people have told me that they'll have an older dog and one of the other dogs starts going after them and it's a sign that the older dog is sick. And mm -hmm. somehow the dogs know this. And I was telling her there's something wrong with her dog. And yeah. I, I knew there was something wrong with her dog anyway. And then there were issues of uh, she had recurrent urinary tract infections, being older. She had uh, problems just controlling it. it ended up in all probability, although she never did get an MRI, she probably had a brain tumor. Yeah. And so she needed to be confined for her own safety. Mm -hmm. She needed to be scheduled and regimented, more like you'd be scheduling and regimenting a puppy. And a lot of times when people have older dogs, they don't realize that you can't treat an older pet the same way you did when they were in the prime of their life. And you mm -hmm. have to make certain accommodations for them to make them more comfortable, to make it more easily accessible to outside or keep right. them safe, keep them confined in a place where they can't hurt themselves. If they have an accident, it's okay. Right. And so all of those kinds of issues became things that we needed to, dis to discuss. And yeah, it's kind of sad, but you know, the fact is if you love your pet and you have them for a long time, most of us sooner or later are going to have to deal with something like that. Right. Right, and she has still ha does still have Bergdorf and has a nice community of friends to kind of help That's her right. through the grieving process. Well, she got more nice. sympathy uh, notes for Colby than yeah. I think I got when my father died. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, and I think all these videos, um, all of these clients clearly adore their dogs. They, you know, have different issues and different ways of, of loving them, but they all just love them to death. and. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of, it's nice to see different lifestyles with different dogs. So um, on part two of Doggy Tales, we're going to talk about my experience this year of adopting, rescuing a dog, and um, all of the ins and outs of that process. Um, Lori is going to be joining me again. So don't miss next month's episode of Life and Style with Sarah. And if you have any questions about dog ownership or training that you would like to ask Lori, um, feel more than welcome to um, go to her website, www.loriefasstraining.com, dog training. Dog training. Dog training. Yep. <laughs> um, or you can call the number on the screen. Her website is also on the screen. Um, you've been watching Life and Style with Sarah. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next month. Good night.